move on. This is the, the story, First Samuel 17 is the story of David and Goliath. And uh, remember that uh, nobody volunteered to go out against Goliath. And uh, so David ended up doing that. And then this verse 38 and 39 kind of speak to this situation uh, when they brought David to King Saul. And Saul, this verse, uh, 1 Samuel 17, 38, and Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of, of bronze upon his head, and he armed him with a coat of mail, and David girded his sword upon his, uh, his armor and attempted to go, for he had not tested it, and David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them, proved them, I think is the King James. Uh, and David put them off. Um, let me just read a statement that I have here in my notes. <clears throat> the haste with which many now enter the ministry, attempting to impress others with a measure of the truth, which they have not proved for themselves, is dangerous. And basically the concept that I'm trying to say there is that people are real hasty to get into the ministry and they try to impress people with um, delivery or they try to impress people with a measure of truth that they have not proven or tested, been tested on in themselves. And that's a real common thing that people do because they're so, so very anxious to get out there and do something for God. Again, not I see nothing evil in most people's thing. I mean, and God knows the labors are few. But but they they think because they've heard things and because they've studied them out, and maybe even because they've had a certain revelation on that, there's a difference between a revelation on that. Revelation of the truth and the revelation of Christ. There's a difference between the two. Revelation of the truth does not form that in you. And so they they feel they have a measure or they, that they've got, you know, they've got it, but it hasn't been tested. It hasn't been proven yet. And so in this case, uh, David is quote unquote the minister. He's the one that go take care of the issue. Nobody else will, not even the king, not the king's men, not the the top guys in the kingdom, not any of that. Nobody's stepping forward. And David says, okay, well, I'll go minister on behalf of the kingdom here. <clears throat> and Saul, you know, David's a 17-year-old kid. Saul's a big, tall guy. He's bigger than everybody else. <coughs> Other than that, he's head and shoulders, he says, above everybody else. So he's taking his armor and putting it on David. You know, I can see David. <laughs> uh, you know, it didn't work. And... Not, and, but it didn't just say, the interesting thing was, it didn't say that, th that David turned and said, this is stupid. This is too big. He didn't even refer to it being too big. It said he hadn't proven it yet. Now that says a lot about the character of David. It hadn't been worked into his life yet. He hasn't incorporated it to such a degree that he's comfortable with it. Amen? That's a big deal. That's, I mean, to have a seventeen-year-old kid with that much character is a pretty big deal. So he's, you know, he's not saying, well, you know, see, we might get all caught up in the glamour of the situation. I'm the chosen one. I have the king's armor. I am wearing the very king's armor, and so God will surely bless me. For the king himself would never have given me this unless I was going to surely win. <clears throat> Thank God he was more mature than that. And few are. Thank God he looked up at it on a very real level and said, <clears throat> I haven't spent any time with this. I haven't proven this. This hasn't been worked into my life. This isn't part of who I am. I don't know how to flow with this. This is something external to who I am. And I don't want to live my life in relationship to things that are external to me. I want to be all things to be incorporated in as one, which is what happens in Christ. So that there is a certain degree of confidence because God has proven you on that front. Amen? And, you know, 
we, we jump up and say, okay, yes, I know the truth. And so we go to share with somebody and we're sharing all this stuff and it is right and it's good. But the, tr the greater, greater truth and always will be is when it's worked into us. When it's worked into us. Then it is the truth which is Christ, not just the truth that of, of doctrines. The doctrinal truth. The doctrinal truth can't make you free. But Christ, who is the truth, makes you true. And so, as I said, there's this thing where we go out and we attempt to carry on. And, and the bad thing is, and the thing I wrote here is that, in one sense, we, we attempt to impress others. When I was in Bible school, there was a, a guy, a young guy, and he was um, just, he was good looking, he wore suits to class. You know, uh, I had come in off the streets, I was a hippie. I wore knee-high moccasins, you know, <laughs> and big old puffy sleeve shirts that you could see through and stuff, you know, and bell bottoms. He wore suits. He would stand up in chapel. They'd, they'd let him take chapel. In my first year, he'd take chapel. Do you remember what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. You don't. Wow. <clears throat> he'd stand up, and when he would preach, I mean, they let him preach one Sunday night. It's a Bible school student and preaching in the Warren Richmond church. I can't believe it. The guy was smooth. <laughs> I mean, smooth. I'm just going, whoa. And then I remember overhearing a couple of the leaders talking, and they said, well, you know, we're grooming him like we would the next Billy Graham. And I'm just kind of going, <clears throat> you know. But I, I was digging into the Word, and all I knew was I needed to see Jesus. I needed to see Jesus. And the more people puffed him up and said he's going to be something and everything, the more I realized... You know, the best thing we need to do is to be hid away. Anybody understand Amen. what that means? Yes. Hidden away is not a bad thing. Yep. If you're hidden away of the Lord, it's a good thing. Last thing in the world Jesus needed to be doing in, in Bethlehem after his birth is walking around the streets going, I'm the You know, they're going to kill all the people. God, hid him away. <laughs> and hiding us away. And you need to realize that the devil is after the seed. Amen. And that's a huge thing. That's not, I know, but you were maybe not even very familiar with that concept. It's a huge, huge, huge thing. It was one of the first things that happened after the birth of Jesus. Yeah. As soon as the, the woman in heaven, sun, moon, and stars gave birth to the man-child, the great dragon, red dragon, was standing there to swallow it up. The first thing. And so, um, what we don't, what we fail to realize is this thing is greater than us in our ministry. This is about Christ. And there is darkness that hates Jesus, hates the light. Okay? And so, um, so Jesus was hid away. And there's something to be said for, for being hid away. And, and, you know, just um, growing. And that's what it said it happened to Jesus. Then he came back to Nazareth and he began to grow in the wisdom of the Lord and in favor with God and with man. And that, took, that, that preparation took 30 years. And some of you have heard me say this before. Most of us in this country, we take three years for preparation and live 30 years in ministry. Jesus spent 30 years in preparation and lived three years of ministry. Now, wouldn't it be better to have three incredible years for Jesus and for his glory than 30 years of mediocre that basically did that? So would you say preparation is important? Very important. <clears throat> so, he hadn't proven it. That's it. It's better to lose time concerning preparation than to lose time in repairing one's mistakes. <laughs> it's 
better to lose time, if that's what you want to call it, not really losing time, but it's better to lose time in preparation and let that spread out over a long period of time than to be losing time in repairing all the mistakes you made along the way because you didn't truly prepare. Huh? And when that's in your heart, then you just begin to go, look, you know, Lord, I, I'm here to bring you glory. I mean, there's this thought. Would it bring more glory to God if you were hidden away? You know, most of us don't think so. Oh, no, it brings more glory to God that I'm around. <laughs> oh, no, no, I mean, I can tell him that I'm around. You know. But... You may be doing more harm to the kingdom of God than you realize. And being hidden away actually might be a good thing. Being hid in Christ, understanding what that means, and, and flowing with that for the good of the kingdom of God, for the good of God's work in you. Because when he, a lot of the work that he does, he does undercover, he does quietly, he does silently, he does... He does it in ways that you can't imagine. It's not usually out there and you think you're doing great things. I'll tell you what, you learn more in crisis than you do in blessing. Amen. And that's the truth. You learn more in crisis than you do in blessing. And you, you end up probably accomplishing, or God accomplishes more during the crisis than He does during the time of blessing. That's hard for people to realize, but it's the truth. You know, a whole lot of things you're not willing to get rid of are, are dress. During blessing, during the crisis, you kind of start, you know, it's like, it's like the guys in Jonah in the boat, you know. When the storm's coming, you start throwing everything overboard. You know, let's get rid of this, well, let's get rid of that. You know, because you realize the real issue here is life. The real issue is life. It's not this thing that I'm throwing overboard. That meant so much to me an hour ago. And now if I'm going to lose my life over it, you're going there. I'm not talking about your wife or something. <laughs> you know, I'm talking about things that we think are so, so important. This, this thing is so important. No, 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 Lord, don't take that. No, we need to. And then, you know, the boat's going down. And you go, oh, let's get rid of that. Whoa, oh, yeah. You know, you go back up a little. Bit. Let's get, how about this? Whoa, okay, you know. And you begin to realize what's really, really important is life. Do you have life? Are you functioning in life? Are you flowing with life? Are you plugged into life? Are you delivering the fruit of life? That's all that really becomes important once the crisis starts happening. You know. So these things are important, but they're important to God first and foremost. <clears throat> all right, let's turn to, uh, since we're kind of in this neighborhood, turn to the book of Job. Job chapter 23. I'm not going to drag you through a bunch of Job stuff. But <laughs> While some of you are trying to find Job, I'm going to see it from the back of my but there's a scripture that I had in mind that I didn't get a chance to look up. That might help me make a statement here. Yeah. shall come forth as gold. Now this is specifically referring to testing in relationship to the way that I take. Okay? This isn't testing in relationship to your character per se. I mean it is, but it's not. This isn't testing pertaining to your doctrine, ultimately not doctrine, this is testing in relationship to the way. 
to the way. He knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tested me, I shall come forth as terror. Now that could sound almost arrogant. Unless you understand that he knows that when you're in this way that he's talking about, you can test me. I'm going to, I'm going to come through this okay. The problem is, in fact, let me just <clears throat> read just a few of my notes here. The testing isn't always just to see if we will be faithful to our calling. And that's what, as a minister or leader or something, that's what we think. It's not, the testing isn't always if we'll be faithful to our calling. The way is not a specific method or vision, but the, the way we are to be established in is Christ's life, Christ's nature. Jesus said, I am the way. He knoweth the way that I take. We say, okay, I'm going to take, I'm going to be faithful to my calling, or I'm going to, I'm going to do this a specific method, and I know that this method is blessed of God because the biggest, most successful church in the country uses this method. So I know that I'm going to be blessed of God. You may be tested according to the way that you just took, and you may not come forth as God. An example of that, I think, is many years ago, there's a big, big church called Church on the Rock in the Dallas area. Uh, I attended the church many times, had met the pastor, um, and they, one of the reasons they were one of the largest churches in the United States was because God had spoken to that man a particular, and I'm going to put it like this, a particular method. And it was pray for one hour every morning. Okay? And God showed that to them, and when they implemented that, there, man, they took off. Okay? Well, all the other churches went, well, we want to be big, big like church on the run. So they said, so let's copy their method and let's pray every morning for an hour. Now, Church on the Rock, would they'd show up between 4 or 5 in the morning and pray. And so all these other churches said, okay, well, we're just going to start gathering early, early in the morning and, and pray. You remember, Mike, when we started doing this? You ought to. I remember stories on you, brother. <laughs> so here we are. We said, well, we're going to do something like that, too. We're over on Bolivar. So we start getting up, showing up at the church five in the morning, praying from five to six. Well, I don't know if you know anything about most of us around here, but five and six are not ideal hours. So we're the, the, we're we're trying to, you know, we want God's blessing, right? So here we are. We're praying then and we're in there and you know, of course you hear some people praying and stuff, and then I remember one time all of a sudden, Mike, we had the pews come out, and Mike was like this on the pew, and all of a sudden, like, <laughs> so it kind of looks up because everybody's in between the pews, so his head's all coming. So I waited, I waited a few minutes, and I went over to Mike, and I said, that don't count. <laughs> stories. I won't tell the ones on me. But. <laughs> <laughs> but we have them. But, you know, after a while we went, this is stupid. All, you, know, you know what we're getting out of this? Tired. <laughs> you know, this is somebody else's armor. This is somebody else's method. This isn't what God called us to do. We're, why are we doing this? You know, and so we went back to what we call searching the scriptures for Jesus. <laughs> But, you know, I mean, it's easy to anybody can get caught up in these things and think, well, God's moving there, so this is of God. No, no, Jesus is the way. You must know the way that God will bless and has ordained. And if you do that, then you'll see the glory of God. Uh, just to kind of bear that out, look in the book of Acts chapter 9. That's, this is the scripture I was looking at. <clears throat> Acts 9 and verse 1 and 2. 
And Saul, again, breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. So he was persecuting the way. It was the way that they were going about it, and the way was Christ. Jesus said, I am the way. I'm not going to show you the way. I'm not going to give you a way. I am the way. And so they were literally, and of course the proof of this is still in this same chapter, when the Lord appears to Saul on the road to Damascus, and he says, you know, he appears and says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he says, persecutest me? You know, I'm not, you know, Lord, and here's his words, Lord, who art thou? Who are you? I'm not persecuting you. I've never done anything against you. I'm persecuting your followers. And Jesus says, no, you you're persecuting me. Since the resurrection, I don't have followers. I only have members of my body. I only have my bride. I only have that which is me. You see that? When you persecute the way, you're persecuting Christ. When you follow the way, you're following Christ in life, in Him being the way, the truth, and the life. And I believe there's a progression in, in the fullness of Christ even through that. First, He is the way. He doesn't give you a way. He becomes the way. Then he becomes the truth, all truth. Not just truth anymore, the truth. And eventually he's the life, and that's the fullness of all things. The truth is lived out by life. The way is preceded in by life. That's another story. Right? <clears throat> so, um, many young ministers approach to God is as an adventurous servant who wants to ascertain his mission for the king and carry it out with zeal, Right? I want, to, I want to figure out, you know, oh Lord, I want to figure out what my mission is for you, and I want to carry it out with zeal. I want it to bring you more. I want to, you know, that's the that's the whole spirit, and it's all exciting and everything, and I know because I had it. And it's, uh, we think our task is to find out what that task or call is in specific ways. This does not require nearness to the Lord pretending to his heart, but only to get close enough to get the facts. Here's the Lord over here. Get close. What do you want me to do? Go. Go to Timbuktu. There. Sit on a pew. You know, I mean, you know, something. You know, we want to hear something like that. Go, go, stand on the corner and win many people. You know? Sounds like he's an Indian. <laughs> oh, well. You know. no, no. He's our father. Jesus is our life. He's our groom. He's our, he's everything. And so instead of just going and being separate and saying, tell me what you want me to do, which basically is what the law is. Yeah. Tell me what you want me to do and I'll do it. No, it is coming into his heart, coming into finding the spirit of the truth, not just the truth. And then when he reaches forth his arm, you're reached forth because you're his arm. You are his hand extended. You're not you going for the Lord. Yes, but, you know, that's a lot more glorious than being his hand extended. You know, I'm going for the Lord. I am going into Cuba. <laughs> Open my eyes. 
and he says, I'm not going to open your eyes. The body's going to have to. So that you begin to see that it's, it requires the body. So he says, go to a street called Straight, and there you'll find a man named Anias, and, and uh, he will pray for you, and your eyes will be open. If you're the Son of God, if you have all power, why don't you just do it right now? Why do you want to send me to some guy? I mean, I've been a big shot Pharisee and everything. I don't know this guy. He's going to, you know, you know, I'd have to humble myself to some brother. <laughs> Hello? Yes, that's who you are now. That's what you're joined to now. You didn't join the Christian Society of Friends. <laughs> you are one with me. You are bone in my bone and flesh in my flesh, and that includes the whole, and that is me I'm sending you to. That's so hard for people to comprehend. You know what? You can't comprehend that unless he, the spirit of truth, comes and begins to reveal all truth. That's the resurrected Jesus. And why are you relating to a Jesus, a pre-cross Jesus? Why are you acting as if the cross never happened? Why are you acting? I'm not. I believe he died. He got up. And when he did it, he went, oh, all power is given to me. Therefore, I'm the big kahuna. And you guys are going to be my big shot servant dudes. <laughs> That's what we view it as. No. Before the cross, before the resurrection, there were followers of Jesus. Afterwards, they're just bone of his bone. Flesh, flesh, flesh. There were no followers. Of, you know, you, it didn't like have his body with three or four you know, fingers and toes come off and you know, walk on. <laughs> No, you're not. You're one. You're attached. You're joined. And when this part of the body gets hit and wounded, the whole body feels it. Yeah. Huh? Yes. Misa just recently got a, her finger cut when she was in cooking. And, she, and you know what? She started throwing up and everything. You know, you can get a little cut and then a little cut. I mean, you can get a cut, something else like that, and your body go into shock. From that one place, your whole body will go into shock, and you can die over shock. More than that cut. I mean, Michael's broken several limbs, and the first thing I, what's the first thing I do every time? Lay down at those feet. Every time. Because I'm not worried about the break first and foremost. We'll get all that stuff fixed, and he's up and running fine now. But, you know, just in a few minutes, man, the whole body shuts down and dies. If, if your person doesn't think like that, and they go, you know, needs to say, oh, I'm, a, I'm okay, it's no big deal, I'm a good. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know, just thinking in terms of one member. One member, well, you know, I mean, it'll get over. It'll be okay. We'll get to the hospital. Blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. Let's think of the whole body right now. Lay down, get your feet up, and let's take a few minutes to stop the bleeding, do all that kind of stuff, and then let's move on for the whole, you know? We're all individual minded. Individuals for Jesus. No, you're not an individual for Jesus. You are a member in particular. Yeah. You are an individual member. Yes, but you are not an individual. Yeah. Amen. There's a big difference. You're not an individual follower of Jesus. You are a member of the body of Christ. And Christ is meant, and here's where the problem is, this is why there's a problem. There's, there wouldn't be any problem to people who truly seen the truth. Christ is meant to be all and in all. And we would say, well, the body is the fullness of him that filleth. We're the fullness of him that filleth. You understand what I'm saying? He's the one that fills and we're the fullness of that. The full expression of him that's meant to fill all things. Yeah, that's glorious. And see, there, you know, I don't know anybody that's ever truly been filled with Christ and in in, in understanding revelation and begin to walk in another life that frees them and causes them to enter into rest that has sat down and gone, well, I just don't like this. <laughs> I don't know anybody. I mean, every one of them goes, yeah, this is so much easier than me being an individual trying to fulfill all fullness when I ain't in. Amen. The only people that have a hard time with this were the Pharisees. Hello. <laughs> really? Because they're going, well, I got my thing. I'm doing pretty good. I don't want to turn in my report card. <laughs> yep, hand them all in. No more individual grades. The body gets an A plus. It's Christ. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, 
Now this has nothing to do with Bible <laughs> God brought you here to bring you under the law until you see Christ. <laughs> I think fast up here. I'm not These guys are like, <laughs> I said that uh, I just made the statement that we that, that, that just finding the will of God for my life doesn't require nearness to God. I guarantee to be a member in particular of the way that God wants, the way that, that by being bone of His bone and flesh of His flesh, it requires more than nearness, folks. It requires joy. It requires, and this is the doctor. Get ready. This is an actual fact. It requires me and you and you. Amen. Forget doctrine. See, the word doctrine means teaching, and that all, all that means is I'm teaching you that you're supposed to be in him and he's supposed to be in you. But we've made doctrine something separate so that the truth doesn't have to impact us or affect us. It's just something that we say we believe. But it was never meant to be that. Doctrine is, I teach you this, and you, and of course I don't, the Holy Spirit doesn't understand that point, that, that you are taught this, and, and that becomes the way it is. And you, instead of looking for your life here, you look for His life here. You look for you in Christ. Amen. When you want to see you, you look in Him. Amen. And when you want to see Him, you know that He is in you. You don't see that by looking here. You see that by looking into the Word and it declares Him to be there and you believe that. Faith. Amen? Faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. So, but, no, I mean, if that was, I mean, I, I heard at least four or five amens over that. But, I mean, no, let's just be honest. How many of us really, when it comes to our life, go, you know, we see something comes out of us and we go, <laughs> This is not, I just can't get it right. I can't get it right. Well, of course you can. Now go ahead. What are you doing in that vessel anyway? You're supposed to be the vessel, not be the treasure. Let him come out of you. Trust him. You find yourself in him, and that's what that's the first thing. Abide in me, then I'll abide in you. You find yourself in him, and you'll see a whole lot more stuff coming out of you. But if every time you get upset with yourself, you get upset with, well, I, I'm just not, it's just not happening. What do you mean it's not happening? The cross didn't happen? The resurrection didn't happen? The word of God isn't true? Lies! <laughs> <laughs> That's what you need to start doing. And then when, you know, you, look, you see the look on people's face around you, then you go, oh, maybe I better start believing. <laughs> Lies! about entering into the temple, inquiring in the temple. You go inquire in the temple concerning your problems, and I guarantee if you hear his voice, he's going to start to speaking pertaining to Christ and what has been said yes. concerning Amen. you in him. Amen. And there's some peace that you just can't fake being found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which is of the law. Not having my individual righteousness, which is me daily trying to measure up to something. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Man, there's just some peace that passes with understanding. See, we're trying to get an understanding that'll bring peace, and he's got a peace that'll even pass that. <laughs> you know, but I mean, we are. We're trying to understand something so that we can get a little peace. And his peace is so far beyond your understanding that you have to. I mean, and you know, faith takes you beyond understanding. Yes. Certainly understanding in the natural, yeah. you know, because you, you say, okay, now I understand this. I mean, knowledge is knowing something. Understanding is knowing how it works. I'll have peace when I know how it works. This peace passes understanding. And it'll keep your hearts and minds through Christ. The word keep means it'll guard you. 
like a century. That's the literal Greek. You can look it up. It's in Greece word studies. Three volumes when we have one week. And it'll guard you. That's where I got from originally when I was some of your age. The Greece word studies where I looked it up and it talked about peace guarding you. And it says like a century on the walls. It will guard you. And I'm thinking, I remember when I'm reading that. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a kid in Bible school. And I'm thinking, you know, that is not the way I've been approaching this. I've been trying to get a piece. I've been trying to get hold of a piece that will, that, that once I have and once I, I, and I will get that piece by understanding how this thing works and I go, oh, that's how it works. Oh, you know. And he said, this piece is like a century on the guard and on the walls. And, he, and they, I remember all this. It's in that book. And it says, it's like in those days, they had walled cities. That's how you protected it from, from um, uh, roving bands and you know all this kind of stuff and armies of other things. They had walled cities. And when you were at rest, asleep, not conscious of danger, that they had guards that walked the walls. And he says, peace will keep you at rest. And I remember going, what? What does that mean? How does that work? How can that be? I don't understand that. And then I remember thinking, that's the word of God. That's the word of God. That's what it says. That's what it's going to do. That's what God's going to do. I don't have to understand it. This isn't my job to dig in the scriptures and come to an understanding that, that causes that to happen. That, that would be because of works. There's a reality of faith that makes that happen. Lord, I just believe you've got centuries of peace walking around my walls. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And I just walked off and guess what? He fulfills his word. But don't you think you need to have faith? Why do we always think we've got to get it all figured out so that God will work? I'm telling you, the more you release your faith, the more God is able to move. The more you say, you know, this word is true. Whatever I've been thinking is not true. Lord, I believe your word. Then that stuff rises back up and you say, hey, we had this conversation last week. I don't talk to you. I am try not trying to convince you. Uh, remember, I did away with you and accepted peace. Now, if you don't do that, guess what? Now, if you don't do that, guess what? You will continue to live exactly like you have up to that point. Nothing will change and it can't change because there is no faith. There is no belief. There is no stepping out on the word. What is the old saying? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and yet expecting different results. Mm -hmm. Huh? Mm -hmm. Doing it over and over the same way but expecting a different result the next time. Well, that's insane. You're going to get the same result every time. But when you settle something, and that's the deal, I mean, there has to be this thing in your heart. There, you know, some things have to get settled. Simple little things. God's Word is true. Uh, you know, see, we all say that doctrine. The Word of God is true. Okay. It gets challenged once by our carnal mind or by the devil or something like that, and we go, well, it ain't true. But we would never say that. But he comes up and he says, well, you know, where's your peace? You're supposed to say, walking around the walls of my city. Glory to God. I don't have to feel it, see it, understand it, or know anything about it. That's what the Word says. And I cast down right now anything that exalts itself. In fact, I see you as enemies coming in and trying to take my guards off the wall. And you ain't taking the guards off of my wall. They still remain. Glory to God. You don't seem real peaceful. Didn't say I was peaceful. Said peace is walking around the wall of my thing. So I trust that because it's true, not because I feel it. Mm -hmm. Well, you thought this three times in a row. 
I didn't think it. You just keep bouncing up because you think I'm going to eventually turn from the truth and accept you. You are a liar. I cast you down in the name of Jesus. But I keep coming back up. It must not mean you're making progress. You ain't making no progress. The, the word will never change. Turn with me. And that's what I used to do. I was real big on this one. Turn with me. I flip all of that up and put that scripture in there. Right there. Right there. The word hadn't changed. It's true. What's your problem? You better change because the word of God ain't going to change. You know, I, I'm sure I probably did some of this openly. I'm sure people in the Bible school kind of went, very right, they're going off again, you know. Yeah. I'm telling you, they're not lying. Got that wild look in his eyes. <laughs> but I tell you what, man, there's nothing like standing on the Word of God. And I tell you, when you start getting on God's side, you start, you do start sensing some stuff. You know, I mean, eventually you start going, yeah, whoa, dude, yeah. You know, you're getting stronger. But every time you back down, it gets weaker, doesn't it? I mean, eventually you're saying, I got guards. I do. You know, I mean, that's the kind of warfare we're... I do. It's in the Word somewhere. But, you know, be bold. Be bold. Be bold for the Lord. You know, we're all, see, we're talking about ministry and leadership and all this stuff. We want to be bold and go out here and preach to the multitude or do something, you know, big and all this kind of stuff. And if we can't be bold right here in this old mind of ours, we, you know, quit looking for something to happen, you know. The reason is, is we're all scattered out. We're thinking about being bold in ministry out here one day and doing this and doing that. And, and, and so we're spread, you know, it's like an army, folks. You got your army spread on 15, 20 different fronts and it's easy to press through your weakest point. Which is called your mind. You know? You got them all spread. The, the, if you can win this battle right here, you got those battles. Yes. But if you can't win this here, I don't care how much you deceive yourself and think that you're going to do something. You're not going to do anything. You'll do something for a while. Or the devil the devil's really good at this. He'll give you a victory and a victory and a victory until you start feeling confident and think you've got something. And he'll slam into you so hard and knock you down so hard that you will not want to get up again. I mean, he will cripple you. But, you know, you think as you're getting stronger in your flesh and self-confidence and stuff like that, and you think you're doing real good and everything, man, man, when he hits you, it hurts. It hurts bad. And the only way you're going to get up from that, the only way you're going to get up from that is faith. I mean, eventually, I mean, really, the only way you're ever going to recover from that is you're not going to, you know, just somehow God's going to, you know, just do something. You're going to eventually say, you know, the Lord is true. Jesus is worth it. I don't care how bad that felt or whatever. I want the Lord. And you began to move in faith beyond, you know, because you, 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 now you have something you didn't have before, and that is that you're fallible. You thought you were the Pope, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> you thought you were in hell. And now you find out you're not the Pope. You're not even Peter Piper. <laughs> you can't even pick a pack of pickled peppers very good. The only hope that you got is Christ. And so the more you get knocked out, the more you the, the, you sit in the dirt, you're bruised, your ribs hurt and everything else, and you go, Dang. <laughs> man. And you start evaluating, and if you evaluate correctly, and this is, the, this is where the problem is. Many of us do not evaluate correctly. We evaluate based on us instead of the Lord. And when you do, you're going to look at you and you're going to say, well, this is stupid. I need to quit deceiving myself and everybody around me. Wrong thinking. I mean, what's the point? I wonder how many times that phrase has gone through someone's head. What's the point? Well, Jesus, you know, the whole world. I mean, Christ, the hope of glory. You know, I mean, that's the point. Oh, yeah. But I mean, you, at that moment, you're just going, what's the point? I mean, I can't do it, and I'm... 
you know, I'm not good enough, and I'm a failure, and I'm a hypocrite, and I'm just all this. And, I mean, you know, it can go on and on and on until, you know, the, probably the best thing to do is just get a gun and blow your brains out. No, I mean, that, it, it, that's what that leads to. I mean, it can lead, if you let that ride, that horse, long enough, that's where it leads to. One thought. You say, it's no big deal, I just let that thought come. I say, and I believe God does, but I mean, I'm going to tell you, I say, I say, you let that one thought there, that one thought is the potential for all the way down here to blow the brains. Sure, it is. I mean, you may not understand this process. I do. So, you know, you say, well, one, but you know, you let two, and then you let five, and then you let 15. Pretty soon you've got an army, and then... Whatever strength you have, that army just runs over the top of you, and then you're not longer in control. It's a truth. And then you just, you just driven like a cow before the herd of the enemy. But faith is a powerful, powerful thing. But it only comes by lifting your eyes from you and your failures. Lifting your eyes back to the Lord. And I promise you, if you hear from the true God, now this is where you have to watch out too, because you know what? The devil came and tempted Jesus and quoted scriptures to him. And here's where the difference is, and that's why many of you are here in this Bible school. You're here to learn the difference. You're here to know the difference between the two voices uh, that you think are both God. One is the voice of those who inquire in the temple. And it never changes its voice. It speaks from above. It speaks from a heavenly reality. It speaks from that which is settled by Christ. The other one quotes scriptures in relationship to your earth life. You. Almost in relationship to your first birth. Well, if you're the Son of God, then you cast yourself down. Well, that's earth. If you're the Son of God, make it, well, that's earth. If you're the same guy. And Jesus always went back up above. My father. I worship my mother. I da 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 da. This is my relationship. This is where I'm one with. This is who I'm one with. This is what my understanding is. And it was always with the father, wasn't it? It was out of the earth and with the father in that sense. You know? But, we're, but we hear those two voices and we think they're the same because they're quoting scripture. And the enemy comes and says, if you're the son of God, then you need to prove it. You need to be able to show it, and you need to show it in exactly this way, and you need to do it now. The enemy pushes you, causes you to be hasty, wants you to make decisions quickly, says prove it in the earth, get up and go do something that shows everybody or that does this or that or whatever. And there is nothing he can do against it. That one that has faith that raises right back up to the Father and says, Look, I don't live by Scripture. I live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of my Father. And this is not the voice of my Father. My Father's never been in the earth, never lived in the earth. He's not an earth dweller. He's seen the sun raised. He's sat him at his own right hand and let him sit down and meet him. The work's done. You might see what I'm talking about, but there's a huge difference of the two voices, and yet the devil tried to make it sound like, I mean, as long as you're quoting the scriptures, it's got to be God. You know? And it drives you. And can, it can cause you to do some weird stuff. Anybody know I'm not around? It can cause you to do some weird stuff. You know? Because you think, well, this is God. This is God. I've got to, I've got to obey God. And because you love God, you're going to obey God. But what you're going to do is try to do something in the earth that proves something in the earth. And your proof is already seated at the right hand of the Father. Yeah. Really? No, not really. And I'll just close with it. Jesus, you were in him when he rose from the dead. Did you know that? You were in him. And when he sat down, God would not let him sit down if, it weren't, if the work wasn't finished. What work? You! In him. If you were as scummy as you think you are, as the, or the enemy tells you, or your own carnal mind views you, if you were the hypocrite and the messed up, no good, lousy thing that, that the enemy tells you that you are, then just as Jesus got ready to sit down, the Father said, Hold it! Hold it! All the way back up, stand up there. You got one in there that ain't right. It's that Mike Wallace guy. We gotta get that guy out. Okay. 
take him out and then you can sit down. <laughs> See, I mean, that's, a, you know, that's the way, you know. But Jesus sat down and Mike Wallace was in there. Glory to God. Whether he feels like it or acts like it or, you know what I mean? He's there and it's settled. And you know what? The problem is this. It's settled with Jesus because Jesus took, took Mike and you and me in him and did a work that we apparently don't know anything about and felt free enough to sit down. The father felt free enough to say, the work's done, sit down. And when he sat down, so it settled with two people, the father and the son. The Holy Spirit came back to tell us about that. Yes. The devil palms himself off as the Holy Spirit says, the work ain't done, you got to go do this. You've got to. You've got to do this. You've got to do it now. Now. No, don't wait. If you wait, it proves that you don't love God. It proves you don't believe God. And you say, I do believe God. I'm in Him. I'm found in Him, not having my own. There's nothing I can do that can establish that. My, my righteousness is my faith in the risen Christ. The risen Christ. You understand? I'm the one seated at the right hand of complete in Him. That's where my faith is, right there. And that is counted to me for right standing because I'm found in Him. And when you have that, the enemy goes, well, well why, don't you, why don't you try this then? <laughs> you go, no, I'm not doing anything in the earth to try to prove that. Why should I try to prove what is the answer for all ages? That is settled it in the heart of the Father, settled it in the heart of the Son, settled it in the Holy Spirit. For all eternity is a done deal. Why should I have to do something that says this will make me something? And after a while, you know, when he challenged Jesus, when the devil tried to tempt him and he challenged him, he kept throwing this stuff, and Jesus always says, the Father, the Father, the settled, it's the whole thing is settled in relationship to the Father, not me, not what I'm doing down here. The Father says the the, the devil went away. Do you remember that? It says that, and so the devil departed from him. The devil departed from him. Well, I can't get the devil off my back. That's because you keep encouraging him. <laughs> you keep giving the wrong answers. You give answers, he goes, oh, this is good. They don't have a clue. <laughs> yeah. Amen? That's right. You need to be lost and then found. Yeah. Lost to your own ways, hid, yeah. and found in Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Found in Him. Not having your own righteousness. Not being something, but being something. Yes. You see the difference? Not you being something, but being found in Him. In Him we live and move and have our being. And that's not just a scripture. In Him you must live. Not down here. Not in your first birth. In Him you live. And in Him you move. What moves you, what motivates you is the realities in Christ. I was inquiring in His temple today and I heard the word of the Lord and it moves me, it motivates me. Amen? That's, that's what I'm and have your being. My being is not based on this earth. My being is not based on what I do. My being is not based on how good or how bad I appear right now at this time. My being is in Him. And my doing is going to come out of my being, not out of the fears in my carnal mind. When you begin to grasp, and you know what I'm talking about? The death and resurrection of Christ. That's all. If Christians have not grasped the death and resurrection of Christ, what are we doing getting into missions and, and, and world evangelization and families and you know what I mean? I mean, all of that comes out from that. Yeah, that's right. Christ is the foundation. You, you don't have that foundation. Anything you build on it is wood, hay, and stone. I mean, it can, I don't even care if it's gold and silver. If it's not built on a foundation, it's coming down. Christ is that foundation, and the foundation of Christ is His death, burial, and resurrection. Amen. Yes. Death of our old life, burial of our first birth, resurrection into new birth, and a new creation, and there all things are of God. Yes. Now how are you gonna 
How is that going to be possible in your life? It's not possible in your life. It's possible in Him. And it will manifest in your life. It will begin to grow and grow and grow and things will begin to happen and, and people will experience Christ, yeah. not Christianity. All that is in Him will begin to stream through you. And you and and He will He will again, like He did two thousand years ago, touch people, and you and I may not even know it. I know. Jesus is going through the crowd and the disciples are with him and they're following him but they're not one with him and, they're, and, and the woman touches him and what is in him streams out into her and the result is she's forever changed and Jesus turns around and says who touched me and the followers go oh, everybody's touching me we don't know what are you talking about who touched me and I say, why are you even bringing that stuff like, what are you thinking Jesus <laughs> He's going to know. Somebody touched me. Somebody connected. Yeah. Didn't just two, two lovers touch. No, 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 no. There was a connection where like a vine to a branch, something went out. That's, that's what he's looking for. That's what excites him. That's what causes him to turn around. That's what causes him to stop the movement of the earth. Yeah. And he turns and he says, man, he doesn't go away until he finds you. That's right. He doesn't stop the process till he finds you. He says, you touch me. Here she is, guys. You know, it's not this silly game we play called ministry where God just touches somebody or you touch somebody. We may not, even as his members, not fully know who all he is touching. We may not. But he will touch. And he will stream through them. And their lives may be forever changed. And we don't know who it was or where it was or whatever. We were just the hand that he used at that moment. We were just the garment. We were just whatever of him that Christ himself came through. But it's not just the anointing. It's not just God touching somebody. It is being crucified with Christ and it is being hid in Him and it is the resurrection of Him coming forth in His body. Him coming forth in His body. And when He does, then the vessel may not always know when it was Him flowing through them, but He will stream through. And people that you don't even know about to this day, maybe in places that think, in my whole life, in all of Christianity I've been around, nothing has ever affected me like the Jesus that was in that person. For the few moments they spoke of, for whatever. And who gets the glory when that happens? Jesus. Why? Because it was Jesus. It wasn't, it wasn't a vessel. It wasn't a channel. It was truly Jesus. And when you stand before him, he says, well, you know, you're not going to get a bunch of crowns because you really didn't do anything. It was all Jesus through you. You're not going to go, what? You're going to go, yes! No, I'm not saying that's what's going to happen. But I mean, any person who has truly been used of God in that way will not go, what are you talking about? They will go, thank God, that's exactly what I live for every moment of my life. That it wouldn't be me. I'm so thankful it was Jesus. Good. All the glory to Jesus. And you just fall down and worship him. Take any crown that somebody said, well, this blood can help it. Don't. You just throw it down in his feet and go, Jesus. 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 Yeah. Yes. See? Just, you're not waiting for some day. You're already doing that. You don't, somebody comes to you and says, you know, God, touch me through you. And they don't seem to acknowledge you at all. They just say, you yeah. know. In fact, what happens when the day comes when literally the Lord changes people's lives through you and they don't like you? But their lives are forever changed. What are you going to do then? I mean, you know, you start getting a little upset. You go, what? Wait a minute, you wouldn't even be following the Lord if it wasn't. You know, and then you begin to find out how 
us Jesus you really want to glorify and I just want it all to be Jesus. You know, you can say all that all you want. And I, you know. But all of a sudden you hear stuff out of your own mouth and go, man, I hate this. This show ain't right. I'm sure glad you used this to expose the fact that, you know, I, I hope that everybody that I touch that is, their lives are forever changed hates me and loves you and just goes after you with all their heart. Why would you say that? Because then there's no question who gets the glory. And you know it. And you're just glad you're praising the Lord. And they say, they say, well, it had nothing to do with you. We just Jesus. And you go, that's good enough for me? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Sure was. That's right. Oh, yeah. You walk off from that. Praise the Lord. Wrestling match goes on on the inside of us until we realize, you know, and most of you have a heart for Jesus. That heart will come, come back up and you'll say, that's right. You will, will be rebuked or you will be corrected because you truly do want Jesus to have all the glory. And that heart for the Lord and the Spirit of God in connection with it will continually correct you and say, ah, didn't you say it? And you go, yeah, I said it because I really want it. Okay, do you want it this much? You go, yeah. yeah this is good. This, this is good. And Father, we just thank you for your precious Holy Spirit that is faithful to lift up Christ. And our hearts and our desires are toward the Son. And so Holy Spirit, have your way upon us and in us and through us. Holy Spirit, Spirit of truth, oh, may this Jesus that we depend on in the flesh go away so that we no longer know Jesus after the flesh. We know Him as the Spirit of truth, functioning in His body, filling His bride, flowing through every member of His body until Christ is all in Him. Lord, we have the seeds of all the potential of what you desire within us. We are not lacking in any good thing. May all of those seeds grow up and with everything. May we never cut off the growth of the seed within us. And may we never concentrate on our own growth to the harm and hindrance of the growth of the seed within us. May we not be concerned of ourselves growing spiritually, but rather to grow up in Him and all things in the Him. Father, we ask you to fulfill your word toward your body in this place.